thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity. So far, from what I can see, it has brought uh, the best brains of Eritrea and its friends. Uh, and with that, such special occasions, we have to thank the enablers because we need them, and it's only through them that we can gather our ideas, bring it together, test amongst ourselves, and finally, hopefully, contribute something to the society that has given us a lot, because most of us, I, I believe, consider ourselves lucky compared to the community that has brought us in there. Uh, as uh, we, with, da with David, we did discuss, we show each, other, uh, each other's paper, simply because out of respect for you, so that we don't duplicate. And, and in that respect, therefore, the way I will frame is just basic, so that hopefully we can have uh, some questions to beef it up. Uh, David gave us the general framework or the umbrella of the, of the region. And my role will try to concentrate or to give you some pointers on saying, within this umbrella, where does air trade fit in? What is the air train economy? Uh, I'm going to be a little bit too arrogant and I'm going to take you to basics. What is an economy? Everybody would know and my mother no, probably knows more than me. It has got both sides. It has got a supply side and on the, on the demand side. What we care on the, dem on the demand side is what do we produce and how do we buy it? Therefore, either you produce yourself, therefore the nation, or at individual level, you produce yourself and you consume it, or you don't have that production, but you have got the money to buy it. Therefore, either you earn money to buy it or you produce it yourself. So within this context, what's Eritrean income and what is Eritrean production? So that what we don't produce, we can buy it. On the supply side, we are talking about resources. So what we ask is, where is Eritrean labor? The labor force of Eritrea. How much is it? Where is it employed? And how much is it earning? Where is the Eritrean capital? Physical as well as human. How is it created? How is it enhanced? And where is it employed? Where is Eritrean natural resources? Land and everything in between. Who owns it? In whose interest is, is it being used? How much are we earning? And is this something which is finite and probably we are robbing it from the next generation, like mine? Hence, therefore, if we take it, we need to think about what about the next generation, what are we leaving it for? That's why some countries <coughs> do use such resources in sovereign wealth funds to say, we don't own this. This oil which is there is not ours. It also belongs to every generation. If we are extracting it now, we, need to, we might as well invest it somewhere. Therefore, what are we leaving? If it is not finite, land, for example, used for agriculture and other development, then it's a continuous resource which we can use. So with that, these are the general context of supply and demand side. Uh, within this context, therefore, uh, I'll try to see the air train economy to characterize it into what Eritrea would offer would be we are neighbors to a big landmass and population of Ethiopia, big country, one, one mi 100 million population, and they are landlocked through the history that we all know. Therefore, we offer the coastal area. This is our resource. It's our resource which can only be a resource if we, if we have customers for it. Otherwise, it's just barren land. Hence, it, we need employment of it. Our costs would be employed, and the employer is the hinterland, Ethiopia. What is my, my skills or my degree if, if someone doesn't employ me? So therefore, it's in that context. So the Eritrean coastal land, uh, just a brief observation, and I need to rush, a brief observation of that, therefore, would tell you the tyranny of time. You see, I'm getting this right. Uh, uh, so a brief observation of that would say, we offer this coastal land as it stands there, it's rich, pristine, what do we use it for? And who can use it? See Masawa. When you see Masawa, therefore, clearly you can see the proximity. Yesterday I was trying to calculate, but David advised me not to bore you with, the, with those data. But just when you go home, try to see the, ca the distance between Masawa and every major settlement. And you will find, therefore, what is Masawa, the who are the, the users of Masawa. And I managed to get that. Magale definitely, Tigray will, will depend on Masawa, because you can simply calculate Djibouti, Asab and etc. And Masawa is the closest by far. Bahardar, definitely, the Amhara region. Eastern Sudan, definitely. At least, definitely, Kasala, the, up to the Mazen, 
that area where the Blue Nile area is also goes to us. This is a huge resource. That is the breadbasket of Sudan, which uh, the, uh, the Gulf states have tried to develop it as the breadbasket for the Arabs. And therefore, anything which comes through that, if it passes through Masawa, will be the beneficiaries. But of course, that requires political uh, relationship that we develop with them. Uh, ASAP, I think, given the circumstances of the t last 20 years, it will have competitors. <coughs> the competitors, therefore, will be definitely Djibouti. And as you go south and the central Ethiopia, then even Berbera and even Mombasa are becoming the game. But I'm thinking to all the economy. The economy can also develop. In its nastiest side of it, it is the military base which are developing and the foreign players. Of course, they bring money. It is money which you need and it is money that you can control. But definitely Djibouti is benefiting from it. That's a new economy. There could also be new economies which can develop in the area for tourism, uh, for resource extraction, and others. So with that, therefore, the coastal economy, I will leave it there. The other part is the interland economy. The interland economy is agriculture. I think we all know because most of us come from that background. Agriculture uh, has, of, in Eritrea has, is one, it is the major sector. It employs uh, about 75% uh, of uh, the population. Some studies even say about up to 80% of the uh, labor force at some stage. Uh, al although I, I suspect this is an old data, but it also is less productive. With such level of employment of people keeping there, it only contributes a maximum about 24% of GDP. Hence, if you employ this number of people and they are getting very little, it means it, will, it simply tells you we are using backward technology and therefore it needs, it is a growth area. On the other hand, it is a resource which we can grow. Why? Because it shows that the, all the Eritrea has about, uh, 26% of Eritrea is arable land. It, the studies show we're using only 4%. And that, therefore, is an opportunity for us to grow. And the Eritrea has a lot growth in it if we use it properly. Secondly, there is also cross uh, high value uh, products which we can bring for exports and for other things. Therefore, by choosing what type of products we use, by bringing irrigation and moving away from the rain-fed agriculture, there is opportunity. So the, the message I'm giving on agriculture is it will need, it, it, it has a potential to grow. We may not be able to feed ourselves fully, but we can go a long way. And in the long run, why not? We can do it. Even people are growing it on desert. Uh, to run for uh, my time, I don't know how much I have. Uh, One minute. Ooh, no. right. Oh, OK. So with that, therefore, the, the next point which I would say is, if we are to participate in this process, what are the uh, growth sectors? We, we have exported our people, and almost a third of our income now, of the Eritrean income, is coming from remittance. It may not have been our choice, but that is a big sector, and therefore our population, which goes all over the world, we need to keep it. Other than that, what is the immediate <coughs> development? If we are to recover, we need to employ people. We need to bring people, therefore, the clearest line which I observed, which I believe is construction. Construction, there is a need for homes, there is a need for offices, there is a need for infrastructure, and it employs the, skill, the semi-skilled and unskilled labor force. Construction is the growth area which immediately which we need to invest. And it, we don't need government. If each of us build our own home, it will create the starting point. Anything big projects can follow. Just we need the legal framework and political framework for that. Transportation, we all know air trains have always, wherever they go, they have used transport industry. We understand it uh, in every part of the world. Uh, the coastal area, I mentioned the new use of that, including military bases and others, is there. Tourism, coastal tourism, historical tourism, uh, even we don't use the war cemeteries that we had of the Second World War, and etc. There are so many ways of attracting tourism is a very clear source of income. Education as an economy, therefore, as a way of serving, given that we have got such an educa educated community, Dubai and others are developing education as an exportable product, where we can say we can invite everyone to bring their kids and be educated in Eritrea, and therefore education could be uh, a growth sector. Health by itself, 
when, when I say, uh, social care is another thing which I would observe because our society is becoming a bit elderly abroad. And with that, therefore, most of us, we don't want to stay here. Uh, would like to, uh, uh, when we become pensioners or ill, would like to go home. And many of us may not have homes to go to, or we may not want it. We may want our independence. That sector is something waiting for someone to step in. Not only once you start for the Eritrean diaspora, you will also attract other people who would enjoy the beautiful weather and uh, easy life back home. Uh, so, uh, social care for elderly, uh, social care for the youth. Many of our people in the diaspora may, may want to have their children educated in, in, in Eritrea for disciplinary purpose, for cultural awareness purpose, uh, uh, and probably a choice because you don't have the time. That could also be an area. Security is a developing industry. Finance, especially digital finance, it is something which we can do costlessly. And we have got many educated Eritreans are abroad. We can be with, with Dubai and others developing. Uh, we can have the management consultancy and business setting up areas. And those type of ideas can be the growth areas. To conclude, to conclude, I will conclude. I will conclude. Uh, mining is a, a growing sector. It's a new economy which is coming. But even China has has come along. But in spite of that, we are still a poor country, and therefore big development from that so far has not been realized and there is no indication that that might change Eritrea. But it's a growth area which we can see. Uh, with that, the, the, <coughs> the, the other point which we, we see is what about our policy framework? In the policy framework, therefore, policy designed for home, for investment purposes. One point which I would like to, to, re to remember is the way the government managed monetary policy monetary policy being a balance between the supply of money and the, the production of the economy. And if you get it wrong, either you create deflation or inflation. The, the, the latest example of such mismanagement which we observed was there was a time where the government has pushed a lot of money in it, and therefore there was inflation, and the currency was very weak. And that also coincided with the period where there was huge exodus to Sinai and the other deserts. but. The next step was what we observed with the currency reform. Oh, sorry. OK. A, 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 current, a currency reform, which at the end of the day, it ended up, although we saw it as an inflation control, but it ended up becoming a currency rationing. And therefore, such policies need to be regulated. <coughs> Exchange rate is very important, especially for the diaspora. Uh, and for the diaspora, because if you play with that, you are literally robbing and taxing the people. The fiscal policy element of it, literally the country does not have a budget. And therefore, that, uh, yeah, sorry, w w one second, please. Uh, the, the, on the fiscal policy, therefore, for, for, for at home, it is the absence of the budget itself and the way it is used and ratified. And for the diaspora, it is the 2% taxation that we see, which probably I would recommend for the government. It needs to be scrapped because it's inefficient, it's unfair, probably in most cases corrupt. I hope I, I gave you some points, but he rushed me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.